We have been running this lecture series for, I believe this is our seventh season, but in fact, uh, we have really mixed up the agenda from month to month over that time period, trying to meet the needs of our community growing its life sciences sector. That has meant that we always feature some type of commercialization topic. So today, uh, shortly, you'll be introduced to and hear from our special guest speaker today, Dr. Song Tae Kim, who's joined us to talk about models of translational research. Many of you have heard us talk about the woes of a community that has great innovation and even a state that has great innovation, but where we are not realizing the economic impact of those innovations at the level we believe we could. So that has meant that the life science industry has gotten tremendous focus really since the turn of the millennium. And certainly as you look at the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus, the momentum is with us. But that has meant innovation across the spectrum and certainly taking that effort that is so critical in the lab and moving that to the marketplace really is first and foremost. So typically when we do our lecture series, we will make sure to let people know about what we like to call the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So that means reminding you about some upcoming programs. So I would just uh, invite all of you to know that this is something we do on a regular basis. Most of the programming we do is low or no cost, so we don't want any barriers to joining us. So to show you a bit of the breadth of what we do programming-wise here at the Center of Excellence uh, and for Health Community, you'll see that this really is more of a workforce development-oriented education training-oriented program where we have paired up with one of our suburban school districts, West Seneca, to launch a life sciences academy. They're actually inducting their second group of students who come into the ninth grade, who will now be in the life sciences track, and they get to choose between business uh, or science for their specialized programming throughout their experience, which includes experiential learning, by the way, uh, where our local life sciences companies will be um, encouraging them to uh, consider careers in this area through uh, not just shadowing, but actual internships in their businesses that are operating today. So I would just uh, invite all of you to know that this is something we do on a regular basis. Most of the programming we do is low or no cost, so we don't want any barriers to joining us. Uh, this is an ecosystem that depends on your participation, and so it's, it's again a real pleasure that you came down to uh, join us today, especially those who came from the other campuses or other locations. Um, Stay in touch with us and you can visit our website and hop in whenever you want on any of our programs. Certainly, a uh, busy time of year in the fall and the spring. So, again, welcome to all of you. Next, to uh, introduce our featured speakers, and I'm very pleased to say that this all came about because of a, I'll say, a visionary thought on the part of our provost, Charles Mikowski, who last spring actually said, Gee, given the work that you're doing at the Center of Excellence in this community, I have a phenomenal colleague that you must bring to town. So we really appreciate that Provost Zakowski, who, if those of you are not familiar with what a provost really means and what that is in the university, that is the person who heads up our academic affairs. So Provost Zakowski is in charge of all of these uh, terrific innovations um, and great minds at the university, but at the same time is very attuned to what is happening in our community. And in fact, he joined our community not all that long ago, only about a year and a half ago, uh, from Illinois. And in doing so, he brought his phenomenal scholarly expertise in chemical engineering and is applying that in many, many ways, including supporting the growth of our innovation economy here in Western New York. So please welcome Carlos Zakowski. Uh, 
Sang and I got to know one another when we were in graduate school together. I, we, we went to graduate school at Princeton together, and um, at the time, I didn't know what Olarian or Lagrangian was, um, and Sang did. Um, he got his undergraduate degree and his master's at Caltech, and then came to Princeton in um, chemical engineering. Uh, he graduated in a short period of time, and I took several years longer. Um, he went to uh, Wisconsin, where he joined the Department of Chemical Engineering and very rapidly moved up through the ranks and became um, the department chair um, and worked there for um, a number of years. And that was a wonderful story. When he was there, they, they have a particular um, lecture that they bring in once a year, somebody in order to write a book that is part of the um, tradition of chemical engineering. And uh, one year I went fallow, so didn't have anybody to come in. And so Sang said, I've got a great idea what we should do with the income from that this year. What we have to do is we should invest in the startup company. And, and we'll invest in the startup company and we'll take equity in it. And when it, when it spins out millions, it'll pay it all back. Okay? And this was now in about 1990 or, or something in that time frame. And this was just a shocking concept to me down there. University of Illinois, that um, you would have a department chair that would take departmental money and convince the powers that be at a university that they should be investing in a startup company and take equity. So it was um, it was rather startling to me, and it, it shows you the sort of background that and Sang's way of thinking. Uh, while he was there, he published a book in microhydrodynamics, and this is a, a subject area that talks to you about fluid mechanics, particle interactions of particle shape, and he used this actually in, in one of his first companies, and it had to do with using um, fluid mechanics in order to place odd bits of matter in holes that had been etched in order to get lots of alignment in a short period of time in order to make devices of some sort, and he'd have to tell you the story about that. I don't know if it went anywhere, but I know it went from there to RFID tags, and shortly thereafter, after having established microhydrodynamics, saying, left academia and went to um, Park Davis, and um, uh, where he uh, was the um, let's see, he was the vice president for uh, medic for uh, research informatics, and he stayed there until they were purchased by Pfizer, and then he left and went to Eli Lilly, where he had a, a similar um, title, working on the informatics side. Now, Sang did his PhD in computational fluid mechanics, and at the time, this was around um, 1980, uh, 83, and Computation was difficult then. When we first got to Princeton, we were still using slide stack, uh, card decks, in order to run it in a computer. Sang would publish his paper on the resistance of two particles coming together, and we would publish it to 12 significant figures because we could. And this was such a breakthrough in the time, right? So Sang has long had um, uh, a desire, a, a, an interest in high end computation, and that's what led him into the um, positions that he held at, in, in the pharmaceutical industry. Of course, while he was in the pharmaceutical industry, he learned a lot about how to uh, make molecules, how to market molecules, um, how to translate basic science into the, um, uh, the world, turn a profit, and cure people. At the same time. Um, after he stepped down from his position at um, uh, Eli Lilly, he joined NSF for three years where he was a rotator and worked on um, the um, compete, the um, well, the high, high performance computing uh, division of um, the NSF. He spent three years working on that. Um, and uh, then came back to Purdue, where he was now a professor of mechanical and chemical engineering, and then got recruited away almost instantly to be the founding director of the Mordridge Institute. The Mordridge Institute was started by um, uh, John Mordridge, who um, grew Cisco to an enormous size, had a great love of Wisconsin, and um, created, as part of WARF, their foundation there, a research institute with one of the missions of which was to take the um, intellectual property that existed at the University of Wisconsin and translate it out into the world and from the great riches that would be generated, use that money in order to support the mission of um, the University of, of, of Wisconsin. Um, since that time, Sang has, um, uh, you know, in that time frame, um, Sang has won the Ho Am Engineering Prize, the highest engineering research award um, given in Korea. He's been elected to the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, he is now the a professor of mechanical and chemical engineering and the founder and 
uh, chairman of Pro WD Sciences Inc. And in our conversation, we've been learning a lot about um, the business model for that startup company uh, that is associated with how to translate basic knowledge of targets into molecules that cure diseases and um, are commercialized as a result. It's, it's truly a great pleasure to have Sam visiting us today, and I turn you um, over to you for what we'll be excited about. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, and I look forward to sharing some of the insights that I've learned over the years, uh, in, especially working in the uh, pharmaceutical industry. So uh, the title slide, uh, and, and to, uh, the in connection to my chemical engineering colleague, I a colleague have to put some chemical engineering in the title. So the Olerian and Lagrangian incentives refer to a basic concept in fluid mechanics, which is also taught to as part of the transport phenomena uh, course in uh, the chemical engineering uh, curriculum. And when we get to that, I'll ex explain what it means. But uh, I also want to explain that uh, one of the reasons why I went from, uh, from uh, Prince Princeton, where I did my PhD, to the University of Wisconsin, uh, I went there with uh, very, very uh, high expectations from the uh, university because uh, there was a, a uh, a pioneering trio uh, that uh, was uh, professors Bird, Stewart, and Lightfoot, who basically uh, created this field of transport phenomena and brought it from applied physics and chemistry to the chemical engineering community back in the 1950s. And by 1960, they had been established as part of the chemical engineering curriculum, and from Wisconsin, it went rapidly to other uh, chemical engineering programs. And this is a, a picture of the second edition of transport phenomena. And here is equation 3.5-2 in chapter 3. And uh, the first, and, and again, I'll, I'll describe it in, in its relevance to the topic today, but in terms of the mathematical reference, this particular time derivative here is called the Eulerian derivative. And this substantial material derivative on the left-hand side of this equation is, in fact, a Lagrangian perspective on the time rate of change. And so uh, chemical engineers are very familiar with the Eulerian Lagrangian perspectives of describing the dynamics of, uh, of, uh, of flow systems. And some of those uh, concepts are naturally translated into analyzing the commercialization process and the challenges facing the university. So uh, let me get right to the heart of a problem, which has been a part of the national debate for the better part of the past decade. And this is a picture that I drew uh, when I was recruited uh, back to Wisconsin uh, five years ago. Uh, it has to do with the fact that the universities have, uh, with substantial funding from the federal government, a uh, great treasure trove of intellectual property assets, especially in the life sciences, and with breakthroughs in the uh, biological sciences, uh, like high throughput uh, genomics and, and sequencing of the human genome and so on. And, and yet, the translation of those basic discoveries into successful commercial products, uh, one can look at a number of statistics, especially in the world of pharmaceuticals, and show that in, in contrast to the optimism, back in 1997 when I left the University of Wisconsin to go to Park Davis, the, the headlines of the day in well-respected uh, papers and journal, journalism uh, like the money section of USA Today. Uh, it had a headline, I still remember this, and I kept a copy. It said that because of the advances in uh, genomics and, and the sequence, pending sequencing of the human genome, that cures will literally drop out of databases. <laughs> and so the thinking was, now that we understand what causes diseases, and since pharmaceutical companies already have millions of compounds in their compound library, it's just a question of finding it, and, and with all these new robotics and high throughput screening and all these tools, you'll very quickly converge on the right molecule that modulates that uh, particular uh, target or disease, and so you're going to have this golden age and this big surge in, in productivity, in drug discovery, and biotechnology. And so not only did the dot-com stocks go through the roof, but all these biotech stocks also went through the roof. And a lot of investors poured a lot of money into the biotech industry, basically 
And that was, in some sense, the golden age for university licensing departments because you could discover a new gene or a new protein or a new target, and you could get all these companies to pay huge sums of money to uh, uh, license that. Now, of course, what happened in the subsequent years is that the industry and the world basically discovered that it actually wasn't that simple. And even if you had a very good understanding of the disease, that finding that molecule that modulates that protein and, and, and affects a cure is uh, far from simple. And, and the, 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 the ability to find that molecule was grossly underestimated, oversimplified. And so most of these target-based pharmaceutical companies or biotech companies that were uh, founded, most of them went bankrupt, the, the investors lost a lot of money, and so on. And, and also, as a consequence, the market cap of the biggest pharmaceutical companies collapsed by roughly a factor of three or four from that golden age. And so instead of a price-earnings ratio of 40 or 50 or 60, uh, it's now more common to see price-earnings ratio of 10 to 15, as, as investors have dialed down their expectation of this uh, golden era. Now, it, the, and, and as a consequence of that, the universities found that the things that came right up, out of their NIH funded research, like these new genes, uh, proteins, and targets that were discovered, they were no longer licensable. Because as, as society adjusted the reality of this long path with lots of pitfalls and losses, the valuation of this shrank dramatically. And so, the challenge for the university community and society in general is how do you take all these discoveries and cross this chasm with this huge loss and, and potential pitfalls and get over to the other side. Okay. And so now I'll get to the heart of the challenge facing the universities in, in solving this problem. And this is the, the key point about Olerian versus Lagrangian. And the other thing I want to stress is that I'm actually posing and, and, and analyzing and diagnosing the problem. I'm actually not presenting any solutions at, at this point. Uh, but it's important sometimes just to identify the problem before you can hope to find a solution. So going back to that cover slide where I have the partial derivative of concentration with respect to time, so that's the Olerian perspective. I'm going to convince you that in the university system, we have an Olerian incentive scheme, especially for the faculty. And being completely rational beings, they respond to those incentives by behaving as Olerian optimizers. Whereas what's really needed for successful drug discovery and development, especially development, is the Lagrangian perspective of flowing with the flow. So uh, for those of you who haven't had the calculus and the engineering, including mechanics, you have to take my word for it, that this way of describing the situation is if you have a river flowing past you and you're sitting at a particular spot, you're taking a snapshot of the flow past your point of observation. And you're always looking at what's happening at that particular point, fixed in time. But if you are flowing with the river, then that is described by this derivative, time derivative. And so for the observer that's moving with the flow, that's the uh, Lagrangian. And the reason why that's relevant to drug discovery and development is that on a typical university campus, you have the different functional areas that typically are associated with drug discovery and development. So all the components are there. So for example, there are chemistry departments, there are schools of pharmacy, there are toxicology researchers, and at some of the leading universities like Wisconsin and the uh, University of Buffalo, there are medical schools that do phase one clinical trials, in fact, as part of their contractual agreements with pharmaceutical companies. So many of the components for drug discovery and development are there. But in each one of them, the faculty are incentivized to provide optimal performance of that particular functional area. And so even if they have a successful discovery, for example, of a new target, uh, they don't have the skill set or the know-how to follow that project to the series of the next steps in drug discovery and development. So let me give you a very specific example. And this is actually a real example, a recent example at the University of Wisconsin. There is a world famous professor who discovers a new, uh, using his biological uh, tools, tools and know-how, discovers a new antifungal target. Okay. 
and it's a, it's a arises from a multi-million dollar NIH funding. And so um, the next step would be to take that target and screen against the NIH compound library. And, and you do that and you get a few hits. And then the next step after that would be to take those results and the insights from those molecules that hit that particular target and uh, do lead optimization chemistry. And, and then if you are ultimately successful, you might have a, a, a really a good candidate that you could then license to the big companies. And by the way, this antifungal market has a huge need. It's a multi-billion dollar market. So that would be the ultimate success. But the problem that this professor faces is that the budget for doing the lead optimization chemistry is maybe about two, three hundred thousand dollars. But he doesn't have the academic credentials or the background to successfully get that grant. So what he faces is he could beat his head against the wall and try to get this $200,000 grant, which is at the next step. Or he could go back to his area of expertise and write another proposal for more target discovery and get another $4 million grant from the NIH. Now, being a completely rational human being, he's going to behave in the Olarian sense and do more target discovery rather than flowing with the molecule to the next phase. So the actual project is abandoned at that point because nobody else will be taking on. Okay. And now you integrate this across the entire landscape, so the end result is a lot of targets piled up because lots of people are getting NIH funding doing target discovery, and none of those targets are advancing to the lead optimization phase. Now in the pharmaceutical industry, that doesn't happen because there's actually both the functional, so every phase of drug discovery, so uh, the discovery biology in a particular therapeutic area, the lead optimization chemistry, toxicology, preclinical safety, and then clinical trials, all of those things have functional heads who are responsible for ensuring operational excellence in that Valerian sense. But there are also project managers who have tremendous power to, and, and are being incentivized and, and being, uh, re, their performance is being reviewed by how well their portfolio of molecules advance from the early stages to the various stages of development. And in fact, the experiment has already been done. Uh, I had the good fortune of joining Park Davis uh, a few years after Ronnie Cresswell had been recruited to head the R&D organization at Park Davis. And what had happened to Park Davis is that back in the 1950s, Park Davis was the premier number one pharmaceutical company in the world. But by the 1990s, uh, early 1990s, it had brought down to 23rd in the world in terms of pharmaceutical sales. And the preparing company, Warner Lambert, faced a dilemma as to whether just to shut down the unit because it was so unproductive. But instead, instead of giving up on the divisions, the company decided to invest in pharmaceutical research and bring in a world-class expert, and namely uh, Dr. Cresswell from um, from uh, Waltham, which is a competitor, uh, from a Burroughs Waltham. And he was brought in to resurrect the culture of uh, creativity and productivity. And one of the first things he noticed at Park Davis, and this is all I heard directly from the people who were there at the time when this transformation occurred, because I joined the company about three, four years after this transformation, is he diagnosed the problem as the organizational structure of Park Davis was a series of powerful vice presidents responsible for chemistry, toxicology, the clinical trials, and so on. And so everyone was optimizing in the Olarian sense, just like a university, of how well they managed the throughput. But no one was tracking how well the molecules flowed from one unit to the other until it became a, a commercial success. And so what he did to beef up the role of project management is he basically created a revolution in the organization by taking the project managers who, just like in the university setting, are either non-existent or very weak with no budget and no, no, no authority, and he elevated the best project managers to the same rank as a vice president. And in fact, he called them drug development vice presidents. And so when I joined Park Davis in 1997 after this transformation had already occurred, um, there were six drug development vice presidents. So roughly 
half the vice presidents in the R&D organization were what previously had been called project managers. So that would be like a university where half the deans are project managers. I mean, unheard of. Right? And so for the organization, this was a big revolution because, uh, and, and, and so the, the drug development vice president had a portfolio of molecules and they had project managers under them. So the whole project management organization was headed by a drug development vice president. And they would be measured on things like, for the projects that ultimately went nowhere and cost the company a lot of money, were they able to identify them early and kill those projects early and therefore save a lot of money? And for the projects that ultimately were very successful and looked like they were going to make a lot of money for the company, did they move those in a timely manner from, from functional area to functional area so that the milestones and rapid development of those projects were uh, encouraged? And, and now you're measuring something totally different than what the VP of chemistry and toxicology and so on were being measured. And so obviously the organization responded to this transformation. And what's interesting is that looking back, that era of uh, R&D under uh, Ronnie Kressel is one of the most productive groups in R&D that ever uh, came about in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the budget that Ronnie Cresswell had to work with in making this transformation was only about four or five hundred million dollars a year, which in the pharmaceutical world is basically a, a, a drop in the bucket. The R&D budget of his competitors were multiple billions of dollars. So he had only a fraction of the money that, that that they had, and yet by by emphasizing the right things, including project management, especially the Lagrangian perspective, uh, he was able to uh, perform uh, a, 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 an economic miracle. So this is a good segue for me to actually acknowledge. So many of the things that I'm going to talk about today do not reflect my uh, experiences in academia, what I learned in working at the university so I really reflect the time that I spent uh, both at Eli Lilly and, and Park Davis. And I had the good fortune uh, that when I worked at Lilly, I worked with what at that time was also ranked number one by J.P. Morgan based on the valuation of the pipeline. What J.P. Morgan, the investment bank, did was they looked at the market capitalization of all the major pharmaceutical companies, and they took away the net present value of their current marketed products. And whatever was left over, they attributed that to the evaluation of the R&D portfolio by the investment community. And when they did that, what was interesting is that the company that came out number one, according to their analysis, was uh, Eli Lilly. And so I had the good fortune of working at Lilly when the management team in R&D was uh, widely perceived across the industry as the best in the uh, industry. And one of the initiatives that I worked on, and again, this shows you the importance and the fact that the team actually identified this as one of the key projects, was a two projects, one was called the Molecule Library, had to do with our informatics and information database, following the progress of the molecule from early stage discovery all the way through clinical trials and so on. So a one place where all the information is stored, easy access for the entire uh, team and the company. But the other project was a project called OLO, which stood for Optimizing Lead Optimization. So again, it shows even more than 10 years ago, the leading R&D entity in the company and in the industry recognized the strategic significance and importance of lead optimization. And it's not surprising today when you look at the pharmaceutical R&D landscape, and especially look at the gap between academic collaboration with big pharma, the gap actually occurs right at lead optimization. And, and as I said already, I, work, I also worked at Park Davis at a time of tremendous productivity uh, between 97 and uh, 2000. Uh, and more recently, I just rotated off the science board of the uh, FDA. So I'm also very well aware of the fact that uh, for a chemical entity to actually become a medicine, that ultimately happens when you get the green light from the FDA. And, and, and we should keep in mind that the valuation of a particular organic molecule when it's viewed in the world of chemical engineering as an exotic organic chemical entity versus what it is worth once it's recognized as a valuable therapeutic and medicine is a factor of 10,000 increase in exactly that same molecule. So that molecule, before it becomes a drug, is worth several hundred dollars per kilo. And that's, that's considered pretty expensive for a company. And sulfuric acid is a lot cheaper than that. 
So commodity chemicals are really cheap, but a really exotic, difficult to make molecule might be several hundred dollars per kilogram. But once it becomes a drug, it's now priced in units of dollars per milligram. And of course, there's a million milligrams in a kilogram. So you can see it's an enormous markup. And so uh, uh, th that's one of the things to keep in mind about this industry. So one of the uh, really uh, nice papers that describes the current situation in the pharmaceutical industry, it also gives you a way to measure the project productivity and the role of project management, is this uh, uh, Nature Reviews uh, Drug Discovery, so that's the name of the journal. And this is a relatively recent article that came out in March uh, 2010. And uh, the experts who wrote this article, in fact, the lead author is Stephen Paul, who uh, earlier in his career was the head of intramural research on NIMH, one of the world's foremost scientists and experts in Alzheimer's uh, disease. But uh, more importantly, uh, he, he was, until his retirement, president of uh, Lilly Research. And in my time at Eli Lilly, he was my boss. So I had two bosses. On the IT side, it was the CIO of the company. But on the R&D side, I reported to the head of R&D. So uh, Steve Paul was my boss at Eli Lilly. And then the other name I wanted to point out here is Bernard Munoz, who has an extensive track record in tracking the productivity of the R&D industry and the various metrics. And so this is actually a series of papers that he wrote. So if you do a search on Bernard Munoz, you'll find a, a whole host of fascinating papers on, on tracking R&D productivity. And, and so this, this uh, analysis actually points to the, the reality of the low productivity of pharmaceutical R&D, even at some of the best companies, and actually points to the need for innovation from out sources outside the industry, especially from universities, and kind of sets the stage for why there's value to be created in collaboration between industry and the university uh, community. And so in fact, here's a, this is an important diagram that is fundamental to understanding the pharmaceutical industry. So this is all, this is all the steps that are involved, and this is again a, a, a diagram from that paper. This is all the steps that are involved in going from a new insight about the molecular level molecular understanding of a disease process, so a particular cancer, a cancer target. So how do you go from that to actual commercial launch of a product that's going to sell billions of dollars and so on? And, uh, and so the first part of this is it actually off the diagram. I mean, the, the part that's off the diagram here is the part that's funded by NIH. Okay? So that's not even in this diagram. That's the part where you do the systems biology and you discover a new gene or a new target. And you've got this great breakthrough that could potentially lead to a cure for cancer, a particular kind of cancer. So that's over here. So the first thing, and now the point is, NIH understands the importance of the infrastructure and, and, and building a bridge to uh, commercialization. And so now, thanks to some of these translational initiatives, you can actually uh, get an award, uh, a follow-on to your NIH funding to go through the high throughput compound library that NIH has and, and screen against that compound library to get a few hits to see what type of uh, uh, molecules interact with your new target. So that's called target to hit. And this is also done in the pharmaceutical industry. And what, what's nice about this article is he actually shares with you industrial data on what are the success rates. So if you have an exciting new target, what is the probability you actually get meaningful hits against your high throughput screen? And it's not 100%. So for example, in the case of Eli Lilly, the probability of success to successfully execute this phase and get to the next point is 80%. So 20% of the targets have to be abandoned because you can't get any high quality hits. Okay? And, and this is from the experts in industry who know what they're doing. Now what happens at universities, of course, would be they get a few hits and they don't realize they're not good hits, so they still remain excited. But, but that's a different story. Uh, and, and then the rest of it are things like, and, and this whole thing is geared towards having an organization that can launch one successful blockbuster product, say, per year. So if you want to have one coming out here, and you have all these probability of success on each of these steps, what is the numbers you have to have, and also the budgetary implications, to be able to feed the bees so you can have one launching? Okay, so but let's go from 
probability of technical success. Here's one tip to lead and lead optimization, respectively 75% and 85%. So of course, to get from actual type of a screen to uh, optimized molecule, you have to multiply these two numbers, so 0.75 times 0.85. So even in a company with deep pockets that knows what it's doing, you can have hits, but you may not be able to do the lead optimization program in the various preclinical. And so you multiply all these different numbers, and you get to a very small number of molecules that can make it past all these filters and get to phase one clinical trials. So now you can see from a industry perspective why it is that no matter how excited you are about the target, that you come to industry and say, I've got a great new target, you know, you want to license it. Uh, their attitude is going to be, this isn't just going to be a great money maker for the company, and I'd be crazy not to license it. Their initial reaction is, this is yet another academic coming to us with a great opportunity to lose a lot of money. <laughs> so of course they're going to say no. So that's why it's hard to do licensing of your great NIH funded research discoveries and patents and so on. So, so part of the challenge is that what, what industry wants, ideally, is somebody coming out with a great deal here. Because there's a 91% probability of once you make it past phase three, there's, a, there's still a 9% chance something can go along wrong with the FDA application. But pretty much a 91% probability, so that's, that's looking pretty good. So if you discover a great new cure, and you somehow manage to get it all the way to phase three, then your chances of getting a deal is, is pretty good. But of course, the, the problem is, we're talking you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to conduct phase three trials. And so most uh, universities that are successful in this understand really the sweet spot is uh, phase two. That if you can get a proof of concept all the way from the early NIH funded studies, and then typically form startup companies and bring investment from uh, the investment from venture capitalists and others to make it all the way to phase one, phase two in this spot, then you can hope to negotiate a strategic partnership with Big Pharma that will then do the most expensive phases. So the goal for most universities is to try to create an ecosystem that will get it to about here. But remember, the logjam is most universities over here, because thanks to NIH, everything is in place to get to this point, but very little is available to get to these three uh, boxes. Now, so understanding that that is the landscape, and all the words here just describe what all these boxes mean, and all the, and, 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 and these. And, and notice the dollar signs also, the cost of launching uh, through that particular point. Uh, and these are, by the way, millions of uh, dollars. But the point is, it, it, it is possible. And I just want to give you real examples of successes. So here, here's something that is, I think, and uh, it's still available on the internet if you go to this January 26, 2012 uh, press release. But here's a, a company called Amila Therapeutics that was uh, bought up after a, a multi-company bidding war. They were bought up for $925 million. And what's, what's amazing about this buyout is that this $925 million transaction was executed even though the company only had phase one data. And this underscores the importance of the therapeutic area and the timeliness of the target. So, so, so this rule of thumb that says, oh, you need phase three data, or at least phase two, that's not true. So if you're in certain areas where there's a lot of other risks involved and a lot of other things that go into the optimization, this decision of portfolio management of companies in, in the pharmaceutical industry, yes, you may need phase two or, or even phase three data may not be enough to get a deal. But if you're, and there are other areas which are very hot where industry is actually looking aggressively in those areas, and there, phase one data is enough. So once you understand the landscape of the industry, you can also then look at the flow of the projects and say, okay, I want to, so if I'm going to create a new technology transfer organization, and my stakeholders have only a three to five year timeline for patients, and I need to deliver results in three to five years, then I want to pick a project like this. So then I would have the success to get additional resources. Now, ultimately, you want to do all the projects, not, not just these, because obviously science gives you opportunities elsewhere. 
But the point I'm making, and I had a discussion about this at the dinner last night, is this isn't about truth and justice, it's about survival, right? So, so you don't want to pick a hard project with a, with, with a very long end point. So, for example, Alzheimer's disease and neuroscience. And I worked at two companies that were some of the leading companies in neuroscience products. But if you pick an area like that, you could actually be right, but you will run out of money and you'll run out of runway before you can prove that you're right. And so what you want to do is understand the reality of the landscape, pick projects where you can have a quick win, relatively quick win, and then build up your credibility so that you can go after all the areas that, and so it's a question of teeing up the projects in the right order. The other thing I want to point out is, is that even though if you read the press release, it says that the company achieved this in less than four years, and in fact, this particular target, the company picked it up two years before the last. So they actually achieved this in only two years. Okay? But if you look at the BTK inhibitor that they wrote, it's an example of these targeted covalent bonds. And Avila, which was co-founded by uh, Jaswinder Singh, that's also in that press release. But then if you go back to, remember this is 2012, but if you go back to 1997, here is a paper in which the first author is Jaswinder Singh, and uh, the senior author is David Fry, who's an oncology chemist, medicinal chemist at uh, Park Davis. And in fact, Jaswinder Singh had just transitioned from working as a junior scientist at Park Davis to going to uh, Biogenetic, or what is, was then Biogenetic, now Biogenetic. And so the fundamental research that came out of the journal of medicinal chemistry was actually uh, sent to the journal in 1996. And then subsequently, in all these years at Biogenetic, he tried to convince his management to invest in these targeted covalent bonds, and he didn't have the power or the authority to make it happen. And then finally, when he started his own company, he decided to do it. And so, but the, so, so you can see that this particular scientist is not responding in the Olarian sense, but he's an example of a successful Lagrangian outcome because he flowed with the science from early discovery chemistry all the way to actual commercialization. And as head of the co-founder of the company, he was basically also the project manager driving that process. And so you can see that, again, when the incentives are structured in a Lagrangian sense, you get these great outcomes. And his investors made 10 times their investment because they put in something like 30 to $50 million, but the exit is valued at uh, $925 million. Now, I'll just change it here just to show you some of the other things that we did. In, in another area of a very quick success was the medical devices area. And so at the Institute, what I did was, I, I realized that the whole area of medical devices is very big. And we have to focus on a particular area that we thought would have a quick win. And, and the, the, the head of the medical devices area that I recruited, uh, Dr. Rock Mackey, co-founder and co-inventor of homotherapy, he and I were uh, convinced that the intersection between accelerator technology, so not business accelerators, but actual particle accelerators from high energy physics, that the intersection of accelerators and uh, medical devices uh, had, had great potential and a lot of different uh, therapeutic and uh, health uh, benefits or companies based on various aspects of, of the uh, accelerator technology. So we formed a consortium called Accelerators in Medicine, AI. And the goal of this consortium was the institute would do the basic research and the new companies that worked in this ecosystem would do the more applied research, but because some of the basic research was shared and pooled in this consortium, that the companies could be much more capital efficient. So if you're an investor from, say, the east or west coast and wondering whether you should take a risk and invest in this company that's not in your region, part of it was de-risked by the fact that the company would be focusing, very sharp focus on developing a particular timeline and that the distraction of looking at other interesting alternatives would not be uh, a distraction that would potentially waste their capital. Because one of the, uh, the hallmarks of startup companies, especially startup companies funded by academia, academics, 
is that there's always this risk as viewed by the investors that they're going to go get distracted and pursue some interesting science instead of working on the thing that they promised to develop. Yeah. Ideally, you just want them to just develop a prototype and, and, and do it and not get sidetracked by some interesting side issues. But of course, from a company perspective, those side issues may be important because maybe your original idea actually doesn't work and you need some alternatives. So you need the safety net of looking at alternatives. And so one of the things I like to say is that it's, it's hard enough traversing the valley of death, but quite often uh, companies that ultimately are successful and, and also companies that are not successful, the reason why they die is because you actually don't go through the valley of death once. You actually have to go through the valley of death several times back and forth before you finally figure out how to make, make the stuff that you promised to sell. Right? So traversing the valley of death multiple times is a big <laughs> mortality factor for startup companies. Okay? And, and the investors will not have the patience to invest and, and do additional rounds, follow-on rounds, uh, if you go through the valley of death more than say two. And so what happens is, by having this consortium model, you can do a lot of that as part of the research of the institute, and the new companies can be much more focused on, 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 on this part. And at least it was a very easy picture to explain, but then ultimately, if it's successful, out comes the, the strategic partnership with the big companies, and then the, there is a royalties and intellectual property back to the academic part. So that was the model. And, and here's an example of one of the members of the accelerators in medicine. So this was a new company that had this idea of an alternative accelerator-based technology to make Molly 99, which is an essential medical isotope. And the, the, the business opportunity is driven by the fact that the current production, 80% uh, of the production comes from an aging Canadian reactor, that uh, nuclear reactor that is going offline in, in about another two, three years. And so 80% of the market uh, uh, supply is going to go away. And, and because this uh, particular molecule has a half-life of 66 hours, you can't stockpile it. I mean, it, it, it has a very fragile supply chain. And there's no immediate solution on the horizon at the time on how this uh, supply was going to be replenished. And, and this group at the university uh, had this great idea of using accelerator-based technology. And they had just raised um, $200,000 for 10% of the company to get started. But the whole project was going to cost more than $100 million. So $200,000 was not going to make it. Um, and, th and they were also hoping that they would be able to build a prototype to convince the Department of Energy, the National Nuclear Security Administration, which wanted to eliminate the current technology which uses highly enriched uranium or weapons grade uranium to produce the isotope. They wanted a low enriched uranium or non-weapons grade uranium as an alternate technology to uh, safeguard the nuclear stockpile and so on. And so uh, the NNSA was going to award several $25 million awards, cooperative awards, to help subsidize the cost of developing alternative and safe technology. So the company was very interested in going after that opportunity but with $200,000 in the bank and basically having been formed a year earlier, they didn't have the credibility to go after that opportunity. But as part of the consortium in partnership with the Institute, we had the credibility. In fact, the Institute spent $2 million of its own money in this box to actually build the prototype components. And ultimately, we won the award from the DOJ. And so here's the headline from the uh, local newspaper, Morbury Science deals with, like we were the prime contractor and the company was the subcontractor uh, in the initial phase of the project. And what's interesting about this uh, collaborative uh, role and synergy is that after they won this award, the valuation of the company in the Series A venture capital round, remember they raised $200,000 for 10% of the company back in the spring of 2010. In, by 2011, when, they, when the world knew that they had won this DOE award, the valuation of the company jumped pre-money to $25 million. So that there were three different venture capital groups competing to fund $10 to $11 million for about a third of it. And so that, that was the power of this idea of focus. And, and, and of course, the, going back to uh, this model, 
Uh, the institute didn't put up the two million just to be a good citizen and help local economic development, although that's one of the outcomes. Uh, there's a royalty stream, and, and since this is a five hundred million dollar market, you get a suit of, uh, and the company is designing its capacity to meet all of the market demand. And, and a conservator estimate would be to go for half the market share, and that's, I think, very attainable. So we're looking at a company with um, annual sales of about $250 million, and the deal that we have, which we signed when they only had $200,000 in the bank, is that they have to give a certain percentage of their sales as royalties for the lifetime of the plan, which is you know, 30 plus years. So the net present value of that royalty stream is you know, several hundreds of millions of dollars. So this is the sort of thing, and we, did, we basically did this in about two years. So now going back to uh, the, the question of drug discovery, as I said, there's a huge pileup of intellectual property and opportunity, and, and nothing getting across this bridge. So again, thinking as a chemical engineer or a systems engineer, you want to go where the bottom is. In other, words, in other words, you don't want to be a company trying to do more stuff here because there's already lots of stuff here. And if you go to Big Pharma with a new target, they say, we don't want new targets. We have more targets than we possibly know what to do with. We want wildlife kills to license. So you want to work in this area. So you want to bridge this gap by optimizing the optimization. But somewhat interestingly enough, the funding agencies will not fund research in this area because there's actually instability in sociology. So because the community that's working in this area is so big, they dominate the agenda. So when the funding agencies and the government issues a study of what do we need to fund, of course the answer is we need more money because look at all the people who want to work in this area, there's not enough money to go around. But meanwhile, this area has no spokesperson, so, so they've never heard from. Them. And so there's no funding coming into this. And so, if you're a young scientist wondering where you should go, it would be a suicide to start your career here because you'd never get any grants, as you'd never get tenure and so on. So, this instability propagates itself, and, it's, and in the current system of participants, this problem is not going to solve itself. And so, one of the uh, realities and, and one of the hints about where the opportunities are, if you need to deliver quick things, you have to understand what motivates and drives the licensing behavior of Big Pharma. So one of my observations, this is just a personal opinion, but it's not a fact. Uh, it's a personal opinion is that my observation, before I went to Big Pharma, I just assumed R&D had a lot of money in. And several, you know, two, three billion dollars sounds like a lot of money. But when you go through that table of all the things they have to do, that's barely enough money to do everything you have to do to run the machinery of the portfolio through all those steps. So you're always chronically short of money. So if an academic comes in with a great idea, then you have to figure out what to stop to fund that. Yeah. So the people who really have the money are the ones who drive the business units and run the big uh, business units that have the big sales. They're the ones with the big money. And what happens is if they have a pending uh, patent clip, or patent is going to run out in a few years. So right now, they may have several billion dollars a year in sales and, and, and in that operation, and a huge sales and marketing organization and so on. But in a few years, that's going to go away because that, those sales are going to go away. And furthermore, his or her job will go away. Okay? But right now, they have a lot of money. So if you have an exciting new target and some lead compounds, that lead optimized molecules that would pop into their pipeline and, and come out for FDA approval and potentially be better than the generic competition to your current moneymaker. That's the dream solution to saving your franchise. And so what you would do is, ideally you hope your R&D organization will come up with it, but, but the R&D organization through its own uh, priorities and bureaucracies and inefficiencies there's no guarantee that the R&D organization will deliver that solution. So you want to look beyond the walls of your company, and if a potential solution comes from outside, then you will fund the R&D organization to work with that collaborator. So from the R&D organization's perspective, this is new money. You're not cannibalizing existing projects. And so you have new money to fund the collaboration with University XYZ, and now you find, and, and that's where you get these big licensing deals and strategic partnership announcements and so forth. 
So this is actually the basis for coming up with the, both uh, startup companies and ways to form partnerships between universities and pharma. So again, just to conclude, uh, I, I tried to emphasize that uh, we have Olerian incentives that predominate the university culture, but some of the biggest challenges and the experiments have already been done within Big Pharma in terms of their organizational excellence, then we really need Lagrangian incentives. Okay? And I want to stress that this is just an observation. I'm not saying, therefore, the solution is put Lagrangian incentives in a university. There are other reasons why universities can't do that, including fundamental university mission of educational research. I also believe that especially it's a trap for young faculty, a junior faculty, to get too involved in translational research. They really have to develop their academic reputations and basic research so that they add to the scholarship and foundation of their university. I think what the answer really, after looking at these observations, are creative partnerships that involve not just the university, but building an ecosystem surrounding the university. And, and I said a, a lot of those things during my uh, visit here so far. And, and this applies not just to pharma and biotech, although specific things I observed have to do with the drug discovery and development timeline, but it also works in other areas like uh, medical devices. Uh, now, I didn't want the potential uh, small numbers of chemical engineers who are in the audience to think that I've gone to the dark side and are completely wasting my time doing useless things. I still have a part of me that wants to do useful research. And so, for the benefit of them, I have a backup slide here. This is the latest publication that I've just submitted to the journal. Uh, journal. And it has, I think I actually looked this up. In the world of polymer kinetic theory, there's something called the Rotney Prager Yamakawa tensor, which is important enough. You'll actually find 270 hits if you look it up in uh, scholar.google.com. Okay? But most of those uh, Rotney Prager Yamakawa tensors have to do with interaction between two spherical beads. Okay? And so, as Chip alluded to, one of my expertise, going back to the early stage of my career, is looking at particles of non-spherical shapes and so on. So recently, I worked out the Rodney Prager Yamakawa tensor for two toroidal beads. So if you have two donut-shaped objects that are interacting with each other, you can actually construct the Rodney Prager Yamakawa tensor, and here it is. And, uh, and so I want to assure my chemical engineering colleagues I'm still doing useful things in uh, research as well. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention. enough to move on with the process, or we don't recognize that the 20% of non druggable targets we're working on, you know, that we should abandon those. And I would argue the opposite. I yeah. mean, I would argue that, that scientists at a university, right, that's the role of the university, it's the responsibility of the university to provide a place to follow those oh, things, which yeah. aren't obviously profitable, yeah. which aren't immediately yes. druggable, okay. and that we're not foolish so to do yeah, that. Let me right? say that another way. So one of the things that I, I have observed is that the individual faculty has to make a choice. And so some of them, in fact the vast majority of them, choose not to move with the project because they're responding to the various incentives or others. But there are those who do move on. And in fact, those are then the ones that lead to successful execution and navigation and the startup companies and so on. So my point is not that I sh you should do one or the other, but just observing the landscape, this is how the world works, and now people can make an informed choice regarding their strategy. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, uh, Just Winter Singh was one of the scientists who did the early fundamental research on the covalent bonds, uh, covalent targeted drugs, and, and he pursued it and, and did all these other steps himself in the startup company. And, and that's the point I'm making is that then that's what it takes to be successful. And the other examples are 
postdocs and students from that research group who then go out with the startup company and continue to execute on the next phases so that, in fact, the project does survive and get to those next steps. Yeah. Yes? Following something along the question because just asked, uh, for So things that universities are doing, and this is happening across the country, and I know even here people are talking about it, are things that facilitate, um, for example, a leave of absence for a faculty so they can actually do the next step and then come back. And universities coming up with new schemes to encourage and support that are ways of at recognizing the Lagrangian uh, reality. And so an example of this would be both at Purdue and the University of Wisconsin, it is not possible to get a five-year leave of absence. Whereas until recently, the maximum was one year possibly extensible to a second year. So a five-year leave of absence would have been unheard of about 10 years ago. I mean, if you, if you have to leave the university for five years, you're basically leaving the university. But now there actually is a mechanism for a university approval process that you actually want to do something. Uh, like, like the things I described here, you can actually plan a five-year leave of absence with the intention that you're going to be successful uh, after going through all those different steps, and then five years later you're going to come back to the university, and all the benefits and everything that you had left will be waiting for you. Yes. Uh, it doesn't mean that for one example, maybe the language is that. Okay, so you said the company and the high one, who the uh, thousand dollars, $200,000 in bank account to the project. However, through some process, and then he get a uh, 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 yeah, corporate award for 25 million. Jump to 75 million. Yeah. Really the valuation of the company. Yes. Because the, the investor is creating from their perspective of what is the likelihood that the company will be successful. So once the company is one of the few that wins the DOE award, the probability they'll be actually able to win the competition to come up with a new process to grab most of the market share for this new product. That, that, for this existing supply chain that's going to disappear and come up with an alternative. And so when they see the net present value of that in investment stream and multiplied by the probability of success or risk, they come up with a number like $25 million valuation. How many million for that round? The corporate award is $25 million. Yeah. But the fact that the pre-money valuation of the corporate award happened to be the same number or similar number, that's just a coincidence. Yeah. The point I was making is that the valuation went up from $2 million to $25 million in only 18 months. So, um, you know, Shiva Sharma is a pipeline. Um, sort of, one perspective is the university can try to move things along to, to Phase one, phase two, phase three, putting the trials, and then sort of cash out. But no. my perspective might be that we're sort of overvaluing what we have. No, in so first of all, those steps are just the recognized steps that a company does. And what is also interesting is in many of the steps, except for phase three and phase two, but certainly after phase one, there are university functional areas that actually do that as a fee for service already. So those components already exist with the university. And the point I was making though is that and this reflects some of the discussions of other universities. Even though you have all those functional areas, you can't replicate or try to become the equivalent of a pharmaceutical company because you don't have this other structure which is essential for executing on that. So having all these different components by themselves without a, a, a strong project management structure doesn't give you the, the attributes of a pharmaceutical company. And, and if you actually try to create such a project structure, it goes counter to some of the goals and missions of a university you probably couldn't do it anyways. And so that's just an observation that, that I made. Uh, the, the reality is, though, the, the most universities and their technology transfer operations are now rising up to the fact that if you have these next few steps that create this inflection point in value, if there's a way to capture that with entrepreneurial activity, faculty, university generated spin-off companies, and the university licensing practice somehow retains equity 
in some of these companies, a certain percentage of the equity in lieu of licensing fees, then the university can share in the ultimate success when those projects are partnered with Big Pharma. And that, I think, is an executable strategy. The details depend and vary from university to university because of local rules. So, saying um, one of the uh, points that you make is you want to have the project manager take things all the way through. Yeah. So you could imagine um, licensing, mm -hmm. small costs, just because somebody's kind of equity in the company, a technology, and then the private sector picks and chooses the best toxicologists. Yeah, right. And, and funds money in a lab to take it down those each of those steps. Yeah. But I would actually modify that model. So I think what's even more attractive for a university to make this vision work is that once you create a startup company or a special investment vehicle to fund the project, if the university that you took the target from actually has those functional areas, then the the startup company does a contractual obligation uh, agreement, just like Big Pharma would, with those units to do those steps. So from the university's perspective, its infrastructure and components that it's built up for other historical reasons actually get used. Right, but the challenge that I have is, if that would work, yeah. if Big Pharma would come in, start licensing, and then outsource essentially each of those steps. Yeah, and if you, you read, see that happen. Oh, it is happening. So if you, if you read the articles by Bernard Munoz and some of the recent developments in Big Pharma, because of their high internal cost structures, they're trying to outsource and remove some of those risks because all those failures in the early stage cost them money. So in, a, in their perfect world, somebody else takes that risk and gives them more projects that with much higher probability of success. So the more the advanced the molecule is, the fewer likelihood of uh, failing, the better it is for big pharma. So the, uh, the challenge is that uh, big pharma is investing a lot, the hit rate is low, but we're going to de-risk by going out to universities. So why is my livelihood as a university right. so the, the higher that I'm yeah. going to get to right. the end? So, so I have to they the can't de-risk by going out to the universities because universities won't advance the projects to the point where they're de-risked, right? So there's a third player in the system, which is the startup companies, that are going to be the bridge between the universities and Big Pharma. Now, Big Pharma, the data point is already there. For example, the reason why Justin Der Singh started his own company was Biogen and I have decided to shut down their discovery research units. So one day, he was the head of discovery chemistry. The next day, he had no job. And that happened back in 2005, 2006. So, so thank you very much, Dr. Kim. I just want to remind everybody that we actually have some of these programs um, at our tech transfer office and here through our CAP program that actually funds some of these lead optimization steps for our startup companies. So if you have questions you want to talk with us, we have store folks here as well as my team. So I want to thank you all. A round of applause for Dr. Kim.